Praise the Lord. We rise up as we pray to prepare ourselves for the Bible study tonight. I want you to close your eyes and pray to the Lord that you come into the Bible study today will be of great, tremendous benefit to your soul, to your spiritual life. I want you to pray that you come in. will be a great blessing to your soul as God opens your eyes to see and to behold God's dealings with man. To see the love of God, the mercy of God, the goodness of God in every action of His towards all the children of men and towards you in particular. And that God will help you to put a right interpretation on God's dealings with you. Pray that God will fulfill the purpose of bringing you to the study tonight. That the Lord will help you to hear the voice of the Spirit. As it speaks loud and clear. That the truth will be made practical, applicable, understandable to you. And through this word, God's own mind will be so revealed. And you will come into agreement, alignment to that will revealed. Pray that God will bless other people too. That God's intention, God's purpose for bringing our friends and neighbors, our fellow brothers and sisters to the Bible study tonight, that the Lord will fulfill His purpose for bringing everyone. Pray for our brothers and sisters on their way. That as they come and join us, this divine truth be so revealed. Impressed, reaching upon the tables of their hearts. And pray that the power of the Spirit will accompany the Word. 
in their hearts, in our hearts as well. Pray that the believers be stronger, purer, holier, stronger in the way of the Lord, in the things of the Lord, as we read and study together. Pray that Christ will live in your heart, dwell in your heart by faith. A manifest increasing grace in your heart. As you learn that He Himself. By his spirit, the spirit of truth, will teach you, transform your life, and lead you. Into the spiritual knowledge. That he reserves and preserves for us in his word. And pray that God will not only make you holy and righteous, he'll make you fruitful. Producing fruit because of the impact of this great transforming word in your life. And pray that God will so shine forth the light of his word in your heart that others will see what this great word has done in your life. That yours will be Righteous life, a profitable life, a fruitful life. As a result of being cleansed by the water of the world. Pray for our new converts. who have just come to know and to taste of the grace and the goodness of God. That as they come with us to study, that this new experience of learning at the feet of Christ will make them to grow speedily. And the changes that God desires in their hearts, in their lives, that the Lord will effect those changes that their lives will be pleasing unto the Lord.
pray that those of us whom God has used in inviting them, reaching out to them, preaching the word to them, that our lives will be an encouragement to them to move on in the things of the Lord. Pray for our young people, our teenagers who have just finished their program, that now as we settle down together to study, that this word will establish them in the truth the revealed truth of God's word. Pray that God will give us the mind of Christ. And the will to do, the will to obey, whatever the Lord is revealing to you, to me, to us, to the people of God, to the church of the living God. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our Bible study. Thank you, Lord, because this is your own doing. To bring us together, to gather us together in your will so that we can study together. And we thank you for all that we have learned in the past. And for what you are revealing to your people, Lord, we pray today, you reveal your mind once again to us in Jesus' name. And we pray that the study of the word will make us stronger in our Christian lives in Jesus' name. Within us, Lord, we pray you put the courage, the conviction, and the strength spiritually so that we'll be able to stand on our feet and we'll be able to live the life you want us to live in jesus name we pray lord for those of us who are here and for our brothers and sisters in all the locations where we're learning together we're praying oh lord this will make every one of us strong Every one of us vibrant and spiritually available to serve you in jesus name we pray that you strengthen and build up every family too. Build the church up, Lord. And we pray, Lord, what we reveal today will make us go forward in the way of the Lord and the path of righteousness. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study once again tonight. What a wonderful thing to dedicate and consecrate such a time like this unto the Lord and listen to his word 
and have the spirit, the spirit of truth. Take this scripture of truth and interpret and apply it to our hearts so that we'll be stronger in the things of the Lord. As you know, we're in Daniel. And we're now in Daniel chapter 4. We've read already, we've studied already Daniel chapter 4, verses 1 through to 27. Now we're coming to verse 28. Would you please open your Bible with me? Daniel chapter 4, verse 28. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. What does that mean? All this came. You have to know the background. I have to know what has been said already. Before you understand that verse 28, that all that the Lord had revealed, he revealed it to Nebuchadnezzar in a dream. And Nebuchadnezzar did not understand the dream. He had seen this great tree, a flourishing tree, with many branches and leaves. And then this tree was so tall, was so high, it reached very much unto the sky. And then he saw that a watcher, an holy one, an angel of God came and announced in that dream, Cut the tree down. All the branches, all the fruits, all the beauty, all the splendor, everything totally destroyed. But leave the storm, leave the stem. And then the dew will come upon that storm, that storm, or that stem, seven times. And then after that, it will grow again. He didn't understand, but even though he didn't understand, it terrified him. It troubled his spirit. He called his magicians and soothsayers and the Chaldeans as he usually did. And he said, this is the dream I have. Can you make the interpretation for me? And they, they didn't know anything. How could they know? Because it takes a spiritual man to discern, to understand, to interpret what the Almighty God had revealed. At last, he called Daniel. And he said, Daniel, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. And that no secret troubles thee, tell me the vision of my dream. For I have seen, which I have seen, and the interpretation thereof. He had no doubt in his heart. The God of heaven had revealed something in the dream. And he knew the servant of the God of heaven will be able to interpret unto him this dream. And then he told Daniel the dream. If you remember what, he stud- what we studied last week, when Daniel had the it surprised him. He was astonished. He couldn't talk. The interpretation of that dream, the meaning of that revelation shocked him. Because a strange thing was coming upon Nebuchadnezzar. And then he told Nebuchadnezzar, would you look at verse 19? Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished. That means surprised, amazed, astonished for one hour. And his thoughts troubled him. That is, when he thought about the dream, when he thought about the revelation, that troubled him. By the way, you know that Daniel was a person, he wasn't just hearing the words, he wasn't just seeing the vision, he wasn't just interpreting the dream. Any time he had, he had a revelation, and, he, and then he saw the interpretation that bothered him. Especially when the interpretation was going to bring judgment, indignation, and wrath upon the wicked, upon the sinners. Look at Daniel chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 28. Daniel chapter 7, verse 28. He that so is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations, that means my thoughts, much troubled me. And my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. You see, Daniel, he was always meditating upon the word. And when God made that revelation to him, he said, My thoughts, my cogitations troubled me. In fact, the trouble was so much within that it even changed my countenance. The same thing here, as Daniel saw what was coming upon King Nebuchadnezzar, it says, my thoughts troubled me. They were looking at, at chapter 4, verse 19, of the king spake and said, Belteshazzar, 
Let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My Lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. Eventually now, he gave the interpretation. And as he gave the interpretation, it was very clear, very direct. He told Nebuchadnezzar, in verse 20, he said, It is thou, O king. He said, King, this is you. Something is coming. There is a decree. There is a decision coming from heaven. The judgment is going to come upon thee. And then it says, this judgment will continue until you will know that the most high rules in the affairs of men. Before he finished, he gave him a counsel. And he said, this is what you do. We can avert this. We can change this. And this is your hand, O king. You can turn everything around. When God brings the message of judgment... When God brings revelation of judgment, you can turn it around by repentance and living in righteousness. Now verse 27, wherefore, O king, let my, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. It may be a lightning of thy tranquility. So after interpreting the king's dream, Daniel gave him the counsel, directing him to repent and to walk righteously before God. The Cadnesser said nothing to Daniel, neither did he pray unto God. He wasn't angry at Daniel. He knew that Daniel just interpreted the dream. This was revelation from heaven. And Daniel was so faithful and so truthful in telling the king, here is the interpretation. And so he didn't, he didn't get angry. He wasn't truthful. didn't do anything wrong unto Daniel. The only thing is that he did nothing about the revelation. He did nothing about the counsel. He did nothing about a virgin. Reversing that judgment of God. And for the next 12 months, God did not bring any judgment in fulfillment of the dream. And what do you think that Nebuchadnezzar must have been thinking? That, well, God must have forgotten. Maybe in the spur of the moment, God said, this is what I'm going to do. And since I just overlooked that, out of sight is out of mind. Out of mind is out of thought. Out of thought is out of action. God has forgotten. He's not going to do anything about it. Isn't that the way we think? Isn't that the ideas people have in Ecclesiastes chapter 8? I'm reading from verse 11. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Because the sentence, the verdict, because the pronouncement and the announcement of the judgment does not come immediately. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Nebuchadnezzar must have been thinking God has forgotten. He's not going to do anything about it. And Nebuchadnezzar was, was thinking, well, you just overlook everything. Just neglect everything and just push everything aside and go your way. Don't argue. But don't think about it. Don't put your mind to that judgment. How can that be? One month went and two months passed and even 11 months passed until the 12th month. And then eventually the judgment came. Look at verse 12 of that place I'm reading. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God which fear before him, but it shall not be well with the wicked. Neither shall he prolong his days, which are but which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. We shouldn't ever misunderstand or misinterpret the patience of God, the long-suffering of God, the perseverance of God. God's patience was mistaken for divine forgetfulness. That's what Nebuchadnezzar thought. God has forgotten. 
is not going to do anything about it. The dream is past. The interpretation is gone. The fulfillment is forgotten. But no, it's coming, Nebuchadnezzar. God is long suffering because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The sinner's pride makes him to abuse God's patience and disregard his long suffering. Did God forget the prophecy of judgment on Nebuchadnezzar? No. Does, he, does the Most High still rule in the affairs of men? Oh, yes. The king continued in his indifference and in his iniquity. The dream had troubled him and the interpretation must have frightened him. But in the passage of time, the mind had regained its false peace. Nothing will happen, he thought. But then as we look at it today, and as we look at what really happened today, then you understand what actually took place. Let's look at Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 29. At the end of 12 months, you see that? At the end of 12 months, why was God waiting? After the interpretation had been given, because the Lord wanted to give him chance to repent, chance to return from his evil way, so that he will turn towards the Lord, and that repentance and turning, that change of mind, that change of heart, will bring a change in the judgment that should have come. But then at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Those who have looked at history, they have told us about the beauty and the splendor of Babylon at that time. Everything in Babylon appeared great. It was one of the most magnificent and luxurious cities in the ancient world. So publicly constructed, it spread over an area of 15 square miles. The river Euphrates flowing diagonally across the city. In fact, we are told that the city was surrounded by a wall 350 feet high. Think about that. 350 feet high, that was the wall, and 87 feet thick, exceeding, extending 35 feet below the ground to prevent tunneling. That is, uh, enemies coming from outside, wanting to come and wage war against Babylon. The wall was so thick that the people will not be able to tunnel through, and that's why they did that. Not only that, around the, around the walls, you have, uh, you have the, a, a ditch. And that ditch was meant to serve as an additional protection against attacking enemies. That means then if the people were going to attack Babylon, you have to cross that river all around the walls. Then you have to dig again, you have to dig the wall to be able to enter. Not only that, they had 250 watchtowers placed strategically around all around the walls of the city. And then not only that, we're told that it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And this day, after 12 months that uh, Daniel had interpreted the dream, the Peninsula got up. And then he looked around. He, he, he got his strategic place very high. And he looked all around Babylon and said, this is great Babylon that I have built with no help of anybody. Didn't even think of the help of the architects and the builders and all, all that I have built. Didn't think of God that gave him the skill, the wisdom, the finance, the resources I have built. And who did I build it, build it for? For the house of the kingdom, by the might of my power, and for the honor of my majesty. You can see the pride. He was proud. Number one, of his wisdom. He's built such a great, magnificent thing. And number two, for his skill. Number three, for his learning. Number four, for his power. Number five, for his position. Number six, for his achievement. In arrogant boast, he said, it's not this great Babylon 
that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty, those words drew the inevitable judgment of God upon his head. Judgment came as it was predicted. I want you to look at verse 31. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. The watcher from heaven, the holy one from heaven, an angel from heaven reminded him, Nebuchadnezzar, do you remember the dream? Yes, he did. Do you remember the interpretation? Yes, he must. To you it is spoken. The kingdom now is departed from you. And it shall drive thee, verse 32, from men. And thy dwelling shall be what the beasts of the field. They shall make thee eat grass as oxen. And seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men. And giveth thee to whomsoever he will. The same hour was then fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his ears were grown like eagles' feathers and his nails like birds' claws. And at the end of the days, I, Daniel, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and mine understanding returned unto me and I blessed the Most High. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his son. I will say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and my glory, the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my Lord sought unto me. And I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor idols. Who did he honor now? The king of heaven. All whose works are truth. And his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride. Tell me the rest. He is able to abase. That's what he learned. And that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at the judgment. And we're looking at the results of that wrath judgment upon Nebuchadnezzar. We're dividing the study to three parts. Number one, the expression of pride condemned by God. The expression of pride condemned by God. Number two, extraordinary punishment confirmed by God. He had been told before that that judgment was coming. And now that extraordinary strange judgment was confirmed by God. Number three, excellent praise and commendation of God. At last he woke up. At last he realized that the creator is greater than the creature. At last he realized that the God of heaven, the king of heaven, is greater than any king on earth. At last he realized that he is the most high and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing in the sight of the Almighty God. Point number one now, the expression of pride condemned by God. We're looking at Daniel chapter 4, reading from verse 28. Daniel chapter 4, verse 28. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he watched in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and by the, for the honor of my majesty? 
Is that humility or pride? I said, is that humility or pride? Pride. When you talk like that, when anyone talks like that, when a sinner talks like that, when a backslider talks like that, when a church goer talks like that, when a so-called religious, my religious woman talks like that, that's pride. And God condemns pride. The thoughts of pride, the action of pride, the attitude of pride, the look of pride, the expression of pride. Condemned by the Almighty God. We're told in Daniel chapter 5, Daniel chapter 5, verse 18. O thou king, the Most High gave Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, a kingdom, and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he slew. He has so great power, so great authority. And they were told, and whom he would, he kept alive. And whom he would, he set up. Whom he would, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up. When his heart was lifted up. That tells us then, the problem of Nebuchadnezzar was pride. He himself acknowledged that when he said, those that walk in pride. He knew what he had done. He knew his problem. He knew why the calamity came upon him. He knew the peculiar iniquity that God was judging in his life. Those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. In chapter 5, verse 20, but when his heart was lifted up, and his mind hadn't in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and he took his glory from him. Now you see the word of God says all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. It was delayed, but it came eventually. The Lord gave him space to repent, but he repented not. At the end of 12 months, when there was no change of heart, when he did not follow the counsel of the man of God, the servant of God, Daniel, the predicted judgment eventually came. God's delay. After warning should not be mistaken or misunderstood for some kind of adjustment or modification of his laws, of his will, of his purpose, of his design. Design. To give consent or approval to an evil doer. You know, some people will think maybe God has given approval. After all, he's not talking about it anymore. God is not bothered. God is not worried about that anymore. Don't mistake the delay of the judgment. To mean that God does not count that thing serious anymore. That's what he thought. God's period delaying threatening judgment varies and we cannot always hope for a one year delay. Uh -huh. God gave Nebuchadnezzar 12 months before he acted. Who knows, maybe he will give you another 12 months before he acts. That doesn't follow. Lord's wife had no single day of delay. Before judgment fell, look not behind thee. And when she looked back, then she became a pillar of salt. There wasn't even an hour's delay. We're told about Herod. He had no space of repentance. The Bible says immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not the glory to God. How about Ananas and Sapphira? They didn't have any time, even one day of delay for the judgment to come. Before the final stroke of judgment fell upon them, it just came just like that. Haman, Haman in the Old Testament only had a few days of delay before he was ushered into eternity unprepared. God's period of mercy and delayed judgment for Absalom was just for a few years. He was doing it and doing it and doing it and then eventually the judgment came. You remember the story? He killed Amnon and then he ran away into exile. 
when he got into exile, eventually was sent into Joab, talked to the king. And they made a kind of a play. And then they sent a woman to David and said, This, this, and that. And David said, Tell me now, is this one not a kind of drama that Joab has said is to instigated? Oh, and the woman said, Oh, king, nobody can hide anything from you. This is the only work of Joab. All right, what do you want? I want Absalom to come back. And he showed mercy unto Absalom. Absalom came back. You will think that you'll be grateful. You'll think that that mercy that David has shown will make him to say, I should have died. I killed my brother. And now I should have been killed. But the king has shown mercy on me. And he has called me back home. I will walk gently. I will walk softly. I walk in the commandments of God. But no. And he thought, there's no judgment. Not everybody will be judged. You cannot chastise everybody for what they do. That's what Absalom thought. Then he began to plot and to plan. Eventually, you know the story. He then drove David out of the throne. And he said, Absalom reigned. Everything was still working fine. And Absalom did not know that judgment was coming. Eventually there was a battle, there was a war. And Absalom was riding on a mule, on an animal. Eventually it was God that brought him to judgment. He was riding like this. His head caught the branches of the tree. And then the mule, the animal went away. He was hanging between heaven and earth. Not fit to live on earth and not fit to get to heaven. Just hanging in mid-air. Eventually somebody came to tell Job. He said, Job, something has happened. I saw Absalom. Where did you see him? He's hanging there. God's hand of judgment had caught him. Eventually the judgment came. Even though it waited for years, eventually it came. That's why the Lord is saying, if you're going to repent, repent now. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the righteous man is thought. Let him return unto the Lord. Only that repentance at the right time will bring mercy and forgiveness and pardon from the Lord. In his own case, in Absalom's case, he was, was, and was, until he was suddenly destroyed without remedy. Saul had the privilege of years of delayed judgment to him. He wasted those years in vanity and pride. He died without any hope of heaven. You remember Judas Iscariot? The Lord Jesus warned him. Was saved for about one year. He was being warned over and over. And just before he went back to the Pharisees to say, I want to have my price now. What will he give me? I can betray him to you. The Lord still want him, the son of man goeth, as it has been written concerning him, but warn to that man by whom he is revealed. But uh, Judas is God will not heed the warning. Look at all these things in scriptures that the Lord is telling us that the Lord is delaying the judgment does not mean that judgment will not come. It's coming. Making his heart as an adamant stone falling headlong, he fell from the promise of heaven to the perdition of hell. Having given Nebuchadnezzar sufficient time to show whether he was disposed to listen to him that speaketh from heaven or not, God suddenly brought heavy, rare judgment upon him. As you look at the judgment that came upon Nebuchadnezzar, say, This is strange. We've never heard of anything like this before. Read from your Bible from, from Genesis onto Ezekiel. Before you come to Daniel, you'll never see any judgment like this. It had never happened. This is mysterious. This is strange. This is a terrible thing. And let's look at Job chapter 31 verse 3. Job chapter 31 verse 3. Is not destruction to the wicked and is strange punishment to the workers of iniquity. Is strange punishment. That's exactly what came upon Nebuchadnezzar. And why did that strange punishment come? Because of his sin of pride, the iniquity of arrogance and of haughtiness. That haughtiness, arrogance, pride brought that strange 
mysterious punishment upon him. He could have followed heaven's sent counsel. He could have escaped the awful judgment, but he was so addicted to a life of wickedness and pride that he could not break off from it. Some sinners proposed to repent, but they delay and they allow the time to pass on until the forbearance of God is exhausted and calamity comes suddenly upon them. And let's look at Isaiah and see God judges pride. He judges pride severely. Pride in action, pride in life, pride in word, pride in expression, pride in any way. God judges that. Isaiah chapter 10 verse 8. In Isaiah chapter 10 verse 8, for he says, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Kalno as Kakemish? Is not Hamas as Apach? Is not Samaria as Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdoms of idols, whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and of Samaria. Shall I not, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, do so do to Jerusalem and her idols? That's the expression of pride. Here the king was boasting. He said, go and look at what I've done. And go and look at all the images I've made. Go and look at all the works of my hand. And see that there is no comparison. No, not in Judah. Not in Jerusalem. Not in Israel. You know when you become so proud of your achievement, your accomplishment, and all your skill, and all your ability, and what you can perform, what you can do, be very careful. That's the way of pride. And that expression of pride is condemned by the Lord. And the Lord is saying, I'm God, I change not. He judged pride, haughtiness, arrogance. At that time, he's still judging pride, arrogance, and haughtiness today. In verse 12, wherefore, it shall come to pass that when the Lord has performed has performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. See what the Lord is saying. He says, I'll punish that high look, that pride. I'll punish it. In verse 13, for he says, by the strength of my hand, I have done it. And by my wisdom, for I am prudent, I have removed the bounds of the people, and have robbed their treasures, and I have, I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. And it says, and my hand has found as a nest the riches of the people, as one gathereth eggs that are left. Have I gathered all the earth, and there was none that moved with the wings, or opened the mouth, or and then it goes on telling us about the judgment that will come. Therefore, in verse 16, shall the Lord, the Lord of all, send among his fat ones, leanness, and under his glory, it shall kindle the burning like the burning of a fire. God brings judgment on the proud. I pray we'll escape in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 12. Isaiah 14, verse 12. It's talking about Lucifer. That was the name of Satan before he fell, Lucifer. What made him to fall? Pride. Got him out of heaven. And pride still gets people out of an exalted place today. God has created us and has made us to have dominion. He has given us some privileges and some skills, some ability. If we become proud of that and we forget God who has given us what we have, and they will think, look at me. Look at what I have. And look at what I can do. And look at my accomplishment. That word of pride, that attitude of pride, that arrogance will be judged severely by the Almighty God. Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12. How art thou falling from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning, how art thou caught down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou art said, is the expression, is the pronunciation, is the proclamation, is the things we say. What's surprise? Expressions of pride. 
the attitude of pride. The heart that is changed by pride. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. In the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's pride. And then he tells us, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is not this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake the kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? The people will say, Is not this so and so that was so great? That was so mighty, that did this and that, and now because of his pride, the Lord has brought him down. And you know what the Bible says? It says, these things are written for our learning, upon whom the ends of the world are come. And the Lord is warning us, he's saying, let's be humble. Yes, shouldn't be, O oh man. What the Lord requires from thee. He says, we'll walk humbly with our God. Pride will always be judged by the Almighty God. And he doesn't tolerate pride in his kingdom, in the heart of anyone, whether of a sinner or of anyone in the kingdom. Second Chronicles chapter 26. In Second Chronicles chapter 26, from verse 15. An image in Jerusalem engines... Invented by cunning, clever, wise men to be on the towers, upon the bulwarks, to shoot arrows and great stones withal. And his name spread far abroad, and he was marvelously helped till he became, till he was strong. Here we're learning about a king. It was the Lord that helped him. It was the Lord that promoted him. It was the Lord that gave him opportunity and privilege until he became strong. But he forgot that. He forgot that the time you were a baby, you knew nothing. That the time you were a baby, you couldn't speak a word. That the time you were a baby, you couldn't even stand up and walk. That the time you were a baby, you didn't have intelligence to, to, to know anything. That the time you were a baby, you couldn't, you couldn't possess anything. But now the Lord made him to grow and gave him great opportunity and position. All that got into his head. He became swollen headed. He became like a balloon. And then was inflated because of the position and the possession that he had. It says he was marvelously held until he was strong. Verse 16, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. When he became strong... When he became prosperous, when he became wise, when he became knowledgeable, when he became skillful, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God. And he went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went in after him and with him fought for score that's eighty priests of the Lord that were valiant men. And he withstood Uzziah, the king, and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but unto the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are cons consecrated to burn incense, go out of the sanctuary. For thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. He was a king. And because he was a king, he thought, I am all in all. I can do anything. I can be anywhere. And I can offer the incense. Forget about the commandments of God. Forget about the privilege that is specially given unto the priest. I am king now. See my achievements and see my accomplishment. What can't I do? This is the only thing remaining for me to do. And I'm going to venture into it. I'm going to do it. And then when the priest saw him offering incense... 
they went to him. They said, what are you doing? It appertaineth not unto thee. You shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be doing this. What was his attitude? Did he say, I'm sorry? Did he say, I was tempted? Did he say, please pray for me? Did he say, if God will forgive me this once, I will not do this again? No, a proud man doesn't know anything about repentance. A haughty man with a high look, with a pompous heart, a person that is contrary to the will of God, the mind of God, doesn't know anything about, I'm sorry, doesn't know anything about repentance. His, his sins with impunity. Now we're told his reaction in verse 19, then Uzziah was wroth. And he had a censer on his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth, while he was angry with the people of God, with the priests, leprosy, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests, city of them, looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they thrust him out from theirs. Yea, hence st- himself hasted also to go out, because the Lord had done what? The Lord had smitten him. The Lord judged him. The judgment was from God. The smiting was from God. The leprosy was given to him by God. And Uzziah the king was a leper until when? Tell me out loud. He could have avoided that. He was a leper until the day of his death because of the pride. And see the price he paid. That's much, much greater than the pleasure of going to offer incense in the house of the Lord. Let's beware. Let's be careful. Let's take warning. Let's remain humble in the sight of the Lord. And let's be where God wants us to be and do only what God wants us to do and refrain from doing. What God does not want us to do and Uzziah, the king, was a leper. Until the day of his death, and dwelt in a separate, several segregated, separated house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. We we'll come to point number two. We we'll have seen the result, the consequence. The judgment of God upon pride. In the case of Nebuchadnezzar, we're coming back to Daniel now. Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 4, we want to see the strange punishment. The extraordinary punishment confirmed by the Almighty God himself. In Daniel chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 31. Daniel chapter 4. Verse 31. While the word was in the king's mouth. There fell a voice from heaven, saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know the Most High rulers. In the kingdom, in the kingdom of men, and giveth thee to whomsoever he will. And then in verse 33, and the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wedged with the dew of heaven, till his ears were grown like the eagle's feathers, and his nails like the bird's claws. That's the judgment that came in chapter 5. We have this, uh, chapter 5 of, of uh, Daniel, reading from verse 4. Daniel chapter 5, verse 4. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold, 
and of silver, and of brass, and of iron, and of wood, and of stone. In the same hour came forth the fingers of a man's hand. This is the son Belshazzar. And see the judgment that came here upon the son. There was no delay for 12 hours, 12 days, 12 months. No, immediately. It was sinning at this time. And the one he didn't have to come. After all, the Lord had made an example of his father, Nebuchadnezzar. And the Lord had said, Nebuchadnezzar, because of that pride, until you know that the God of heaven reigns in the affairs in the kingdoms of men, you will be driven away from the, uh, from the society of men, and you will eat grass like the beast of the field. And then the Lord waited 12, 12, 12 months before the judgment came. In the case of Belshazzar, it came immediately in the same hour. Came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the place of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed. And it thus troubled him. So that the joints of his loins were loose, and his knees moved one against another. You see how the judgment came? God still brings judgment today. From the royal residence, Nebuchadnezzar could see the splendor of the capital of his empire. The, the sight filled him with the glorious boasting. And the judgment of heaven fell upon him was a verbal expression of pride, the greatest of Nebuchadnezzar says that judgment fell upon him at this time. When you think about this, or you make a comparison between what Nebuchadnezzar had done before, what Nebuchadnezzar had said before, this one that he said now is not this Babylon, great Babylon, that I have built for the house of the kingdom, by the might of my power, and for the honor of my majesty. Yes, we know it's sinful to say that. We know it's pride that made him to say that. We know it's the haughtiness in the heart of the man that made him to say that. But the question is, was that the greatest sin that this man, Nebuchadnezzar, had committed? No. He had committed some other sins before. What had he done before? Number one, he had made an image, an idol of gold. That's even more serious. To make an image of gold. That's more serious than just saying, look at Babylon. I built it for the greatness of my might, by my, for my majesty. Not only that, number two, he had compelled people and nations to worship his idol. Isn't that very serious? To make thousands of people, who knows, millions of people, to command them and compel them to worship idol. That was a great sin. And yet, this kind of judgment did not fall at that time. You know what the Lord is telling us? A person may commit his sin now, and then nothing happens. Then he commits another sin, and nothing happens. And he commits another sin, and nothing happens. And then after that, he does a little thing. A so-called minor sin. A so-called sin that you should have overlooked. But then God says, this is the time for the judgment to come. Even though what he has done now appears little in comparison with what he had done before. Because now, this last drop made the cup of iniquity to be full. You know that in the past, he had despised and blasphemed God. He said, if you don't worship my idol, and I decide to throw you into the furnace of fire, who is that God that will deliver you out of my hand? God didn't punish him at that time. His cup was still being full. You know what I'm telling you? There are people that commit sin. And they commit sin little by little by little. They commit sin stage after stage. One level after another level. And then the judgment will have been announcing the wrath of God. We have been talking about the not fall upon them. And they say, you see now. All this is, they say, judgment is coming. Flee and escape from the wrath to come. Nothing is happening. Who will say that that thing I did the other time is not sinful. I did it and nothing happened. Just wait. It's coming. And then Nebuchadnezzar again were told that he threw the faithful people of God, servants of God, into the furnace of fire. I think that's even more serious. 
more serious than just saying, it's not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of my kingdom of the kingdom by the might of my power i built it for the honor of my majesty i think throwing three people into the furnace of fire and killing them off like that which you wanted to do i would have thought this one is more serious yes it's more serious but his cup was getting full it was it was going stage by stage and level after level eventually he even consulted magicians and soothsayers and then now the final drop that made the cup of iniquity to be filled up. Uh, do you know there's a language like that in the Bible that God says, I'm still waiting. Yes, they are sinful, but I'm still waiting. Yes, they have done wrong, but I'm still waiting. And then eventually they do something and the cup of iniquity now is full. We're looking at Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, we're looking at verse 16. Genesis 15, 16. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God said, I'm going to judge the Amorites. They're very sinful people, wicked people. They're notorious for immorality and iniquity. But the judgment is coming. It's not now. Why is it not now? Because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And let's look at First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 16. Forbidding us to speak. To the Gentiles that they might be saved. To fill up their sins always. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. The Lord here is saying these Jewish people, they killed the Lord Jesus Christ. And now Jesus rose from the dead. And the disciples are going about and preaching the gospel. And then these people, same people that killed the Lord Jesus Christ, they said, we killed him, his only begotten son was still alive. All those parables he told that the king sent his son to come and get the fruit out of the vineyard. And now they killed the son. What do you think he will do to those wicked people? He will miserably destroy them. But we killed the only begotten son of God and he has not done anything. But they continued now and it says they are forbidding us and hindering us from preaching the gospel to the Gentiles that they might be saved. And it is to fill up to make full their cup of iniquity until the wrath of God, until the judgment of God will come upon them to the uttermost. Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 32 and verse 33. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus used the same language. Concerning the Pharisees filling up the cup of the iniquity. And when it's full, then judgment will come. Matthew 23, verse 32. Fill ye up the measure of your fathers. Fill it up. The things you do, even though you have been sinning and the Lord has been sparing you, just waiting, not willing that anybody should perish, but at all shall come to repentance. It says, you fill it up, and then ye serpents and ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape? Once the cup of iniquity is full, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? You remember Nineveh? Nineveh had 40 days of respite. And he repented. So the judgment did not come. At the end, at the first announcement of judgment against Ahab, he was alarmed. And he had a momentary repentance. Yet, he did not stay in that repentance. The Lord said, because he repented, I'll not bring the judgment. Eventually, he went back into his evil. Because Jezebel, his wife, instigated him, influenced him, almost compelled him to remain, to continue in evil. Eventually, the judgment came. 
We're looking at Obadiah verses 3 and 4. Obadiah verses 3 and 4. Judgment comes eventually after God has manifested patience, long-suffering, mercy, delaying the judgment. A pride continues. Judgment eventually comes. Obadiah verse 3. The pride of thine heart has deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that says in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? You see that pride? Who shall bring me down? I am and nobody else. I do and nobody can hinder. I say what I want and nobody can contradict it. I live the way I want and nobody can check me or put me under control. That pride will bring the man down. Look at verse 4. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, though thou set thy nest upon the stars, thence will I bring thee down, says the Lord. I pray God will help us. Have mercy on us and turn away from pride. Arrogance, haughtiness, evil of every form, every shape, so that the judgment of God will not come upon us in Jesus' name. In Job chapter 24, verse 24, Job chapter 24, verse 24, they are exalted for a little while, but are gone and brought low. You see that? They are exalted for a little while. And God will not allow anyone to continue indefinitely in any sin, and especially in the sin of pride. They are exalted for a little while, but are gone and brought low. They are taken out of the way as all other, and cut off as the tops of the ears of corn. And if it be not so now, who will make me a liar? And make my speech nothing worth. Job chapter 26. Job chapter 26, verses 11 and 12. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. He divided the sea with his power. And by his understanding, he smites through the proud. He knows when to get the proud. And he knows when to smite the proud. He knows when to judge the proud. He knows when to bring down the proud. He knows when to crush the proud. And you know, sometimes if you don't understand that somebody has been committing some secret sin in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord had never done anything about it, and or just saying, repent, turn. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Why will you die, O backslider? But everybody has been saying, brother, sister, brother, sister. And a fellow has been living in sin, and just, you know what I mean, having his own day, his own way. And one day, he now does something, and what he does appears minute, appears small, appears negligible, appears like nothing. He just, we say he just made a mistake, and he said something he shouldn't have said. He just came up with and just said, it's not this Babylon that I have built for the glory of my, the majesty of my name, and by my power and my skill. And then God brings judgment. A finality comes. And then we say, how can God do this? Look at what that man has done. It's not that serious. Why don't we just warn him? We don't know. We don't understand. Do you know what he has been doing in secret? And do you know how he has been filling that cup and filling that cup and filling that cup until the cup of iniquity becomes full and then that proud word, arrogant word, boasting word then comes out of the mouth and God says, that is enough. And because you do not know the history of the man, you do not know what he has been doing in the secret, which God knows. And when God brings judgment over that, 
seemingly insignificant thing, then we say, how can it be like this? But God is wise. God knows what he's doing. And I pray that those of us who are learning the word of God will take note and will not go on in any sin in pride in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 11. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the Lord, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up. And ye shall be brought low. It says, everyone, everyone, everyone that is lifted up. Begin to ask yourself, are you proud? And what are you proud about? What makes you proud? Your knowledge? Your skill? Your position? Your privilege? Your ability to do something others cannot do? That makes you proud in your heart. It starts in the heart. And then after that, it's expressed with the mouth. And then it's revealed in action. And then sometimes so you do it as if, here I am. I'll do what I'll do. Who can hold me? There's a God in heaven. Nobody could judge Nebuchadnezzar on earth. No high court, no supreme court could judge Nebuchadnezzar at his own time. But the word came from heaven. To you it is said, O king, Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom is departed from thee. I pray we'll escape that judgment. In verse 17, And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Isaiah chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 9. Isaiah 23, verse 9. The Lord of hosts has purposed it to stain the pride of all glory. The Lord God of heaven, the one that judged Pharaoh, judged Nebuchadnezzar, judged Herod, that same God has purposed it to stain the pride of all glory, and to bring into contempt all the honorable of the earth. We're told in Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 12. Let's see how God brought the judgment immediately, swiftly, without a moment's warning. And let us see. How God still judges today. Because he says, I am God, I change not. God doesn't change. He doesn't say, now I'm adjusting and I've adjusted to you. I've adjusted to you. The attitude of people, the actions of people, the haughtiness of men and women, and the pride of men and women. I'm adjusting. And since they will not change, I have to change never, never. When he threatened the flood upon the, upon the people at the time of Noah, for 120 years they did not change. But God did not change because of that. The judgment still came. And the same thing God says, I'm God, I change not. His standards change not. His pronouncements change not. His judgments change not. His decisions change not. And wherever there is pride, those that walk in pride, he is able, not only able, he is determined that he will abase them. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 20. Acts chapter 12, verse 20. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon the said day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne. 
and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. You see, this it is a simple story, something that happened in that community. And then because Herod had been helping the community, giving them some age. They wanted to be at peace with him. So they called him. They said, please uh, come and talk to us. We will be submissive unto you. And then he made a speech. Gave a speech. Oration. And the oratory was so great and so high. And the people were so stirred up by the way he spoke. And they gave a shout and they said, This is not the voice of a man. This is the voice of a God. And he, he himself became inflated, elated, proud, exalted by what he said. Be, be, be aware and beware. Be aware when people flatter you and beware of that flattery. Be aware when people praise you and they exalt you above who you are. Be aware that is empty praise. And beware of that pride coming in the heart. Be aware when you have done something great and something good because of human skill. And because of human ingenuity. And because of human ability. And everybody is talking about it. Beware of the thought of your heart. I'm so great. Nobody like me. That's pride. And God is going to judge it. Look at verse 22. In verse 22. We're told. The people gave a shout. Saying. It is the voice of a God. And not of a man. And immediately, the angel of the Lord did what? Smote him. And then what happened? Tell me out loud. Because he gave not God the glory. And then he was eating of worms and gave up the ghost. And then went to heaven. Where did he go? Can you imagine somebody going out of the house? Do this, do this, do this. I want to go and see these people. I want to give a speech to them. I'll come back in about two or three hours. And then he left, gave that speech, great oration, and the people shouted. And then he said, huh, I'm great. When I get back home, I'm going to tell my wife, I'm going to tell all the people at home today, I became so exalted and so honored and so lifted up. In fact, the people said, they are giving me a new title now. I'm no more a man. I am a God. I'm going to tell my wife today when I get back home. And before he got back home, the angel struck him right there. He died and was eating of worms. Instead of going home, he went to hell. Think about that. That's why I was studying. So that these studies will turn us around. These studies will change us. And will cancel and crush and destroy. And take away pride from the heart of man. In fact, the reason why God revealed that dream unto Nebuchadnezzar. Is so that he will hide the pride away from him. And I pray the purpose of God in teaching us all this will be fulfilled in Jesus name. And hide pride away from us. Now we come to chapter uh, 4. Chapter 4 of Daniel. And we're reading from verse 34. Daniel. Chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 34. Daniel chapter 4. Verse 34. And at the end of the days, I, Daniel, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven. What does that mean? At the end of the days. At the end of the days. That means the judgment now had had its effect. What effect? Do you remember what he had been told? Look at chapter 4 of Daniel verse 16. Daniel chapter 4 verse 16. Let his heart be changed. From man's, from man's. And let a bee's heart be given unto him. And let seven times pass over him. The seven times are passed now. At the end of the days. Look at verse 23. Seven times. Whereas the king saw a watcher and an holy one coming down from heaven. And saying, 
He would the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a bunch of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it wet, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field. Till when? Till seven times pass over him. That's what it means when it says, at the end of the days. When the seven times have passed over him. Look at verse 25. Then they shall drive thee from men. And thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make thee eat grass as oxen. And they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. Seven times shall pass over thee. At the end of the day, seven times passing over him. And then we're looking at verse 32. And they shall drive thee from men. And thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make thee each grass as oxen. And seven times shall pass over thee. When you come to now, verse 34. And at the end of the days, that means at the end of the seven times. What does that mean? Seven times. Daniel uses that a word or those words times, times, times. He says that a number of times. And we know what it means because of the way he has used it. Let's look at chapter 7 of Daniel. Chapter 7 of Daniel, verse 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And shall sing to change times and laws, and they shall be given unto, unto his son until a time and times and the dividing of a time. Time, one. Times plus two, that's three. And dividing of a time, three and a half. Three and a half times. What does that mean? Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. We're looking at verse 7. And I had the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river, when he heard, when he held up his right hand, and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, one times, plus two, that's three, and a an half, three and a half. You see that language? Time, times, half a time. Revelation, I'm reading from chapter 12, verse 14. Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. It tells us here, And the wo- and to the woman were given two wings of, of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into a place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. The same thing. Time, times, half a time. That's three and a half. Three and a half times. But what will that mean? In Revelation chapter 11 verse 2. Revelation 11 verse 2. But the court which is without the temple, live out and measure it not. For it is given to the Gentiles, and the holy city shall, shall they tread on the foot forty and two months. Forty-two months. That's 12 months, 12 months, 12 months, that's 36 plus 6, 42, three and a half years. That means then, three and a half times is three and a half years. A time is one year. Seven times, that means what? Seven years. Nebuchadnezzar, you'll be driven away from men. You'll be driven away from the throne. You'll be dethroned and deposed. And it is not that you will go to live in the yard, or you're going to live among the poor, or you'll be among the illiterate human beings, but those who don't have high position, you'll be degraded below the level of the lowest man. You will be with the animals of the field, and then you will not even change your clothes. You'll be having that one single cloth, and then the dew will be falling over you for seven times, for seven seasons, for seven years. You'll be there. And then until, until you know something, the seven years will not, will not reverse the verdict. 
if something else did not happen. What is it that will happen? So that the judgment will be taken away. We're coming back to Daniel now. Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 4, we're looking at verse 17. Notice this. It's not just automatic. I mean, you know, he's been under chastisement now for seven times. It's been under the judgment of God for seven times. And the dew has been falling upon him for seven times. Why don't you, O Lord, reverse the verdict? After all, seven times have passed. There are two things mentioned. Number one, seven times. Number two, until you know that the Most High ruleth in the affairs of man. Until. There are two things. Therefore, the seven years, yes, that's part of it. But the seven years will not just automatically change the judgment if something else does not happen. Chapter 4, Daniel chapter 4 verse 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high rulers in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over each the basest of men. Nebuchadnezzar, there will be seven times, but after the seven times, it's not automatic you'll come back. After the seven years, it's not automatic that you'll come back. Nebuchadnezzar, yes, we know seven times. That's a long period. How long is that? Well, 30 days into one month. You have 2,520 days. And Nebuchadnezzar, there's no point just counting days. I spent 1,000 days now. 2,000 days now. 2,500 days now. It remains 20 days for seven years to be over. And then I, I, I spent 2,518 days. Two days now I'll be restored. No, Nebuchadnezzar, it's not just a matter of days. It's not just a matter of times. It's not just a matter of years. It is a matter until thou know that the most high rulers in the affairs of men. Verse 25. In verse 25, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make thee eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee. That's one condition. Till thou know. Till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth thee to whomsoever he will. Brothers and sisters, will you please look up? You know, sometimes when God is rebuking us for something, when he's correcting us for something, instead of looking at our heart, instead of looking at our character, instead of looking at how we honor the Lord, until you know that the Most High ruleth, that the will of the Most High must be done, and that the will of man must be swallowed up in the will of God. We're only counting days, and we're saying, do you know now, I've been three months under this rebuke, I've been three months under this chastisement, I've been three months under this uh, correction and look at the time is going the time is going but do you know that the most high rulers in the affairs of men are you giving the glory and the honor to god have, do you have a change of heart a change of life that's what the lord is looking for it's not just counting years and months and days it's telling us in verse 26 chapter 4 verse 26 and whereas they commanded to leave the storm of the three rules, thy kingdom shall be shown to thee. After that, thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Nebuchadnezzar, this is the interpretation. Judgment is coming. You'll be deposed and dethroned. You'll be gotten out of the throne. And then the Lord still wants you to come back. You know, it's a merciful God. He's leaving the storm there. And the dew is falling on the storm. On the, on the storm. Now you will come back 
When will I come back? Daniel, tell me. I'm eager to know. After that discipline, after that correction, I want to know when I will come back. After that thou shalt have known that the Most High, that the God of heaven, and the heavens do rule. Verse 32. And it shall drive thee from men. And thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make thee eat grass. And seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth thee to whomsoever he will. Nebuchadnezzar, when you come to the knowledge that this is of God, that I don't merit this, I cannot end this. This is only God and the action of the Almighty God until thou know. Correct that mistake in your heart for yourself, for your friends. When somebody has committed sin, let's say the sin of immorality, the sin of fornication or adultery, and it's disciplined, and then we're told, now go and pray. Instead of praying, he goes on into, in that adultery. And you don't know. And people don't know. And then people are counting days. And they're counting weeks and months and years. And they're saying, during the time, they have chance to ask any question. Sir, how long will somebody stay under discipline? Under correction? Under chastisement? We know some people in our church who have been corrected and chastised. God is merciful and God forgives. And when God forgives, he forgets. When are they going to be restored? One year is gone. Two years gone. Three years gone. When are they going to be restored? Until they know that God rules in the kingdom of men. Until they know that the will of God is your sanctification. Until they know that without holiness no man shall see the Lord. Until they know that blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see the Lord. Until they know that God is watching for their repentance and righteousness. It's not just a matter of years, of months, of days. That's what God was telling Nebuchadnezzar through Daniel. And that's what God is telling us. I pray we'll hear the word of the Spirit in Jesus' name. And so eventually now, he says, look at chapter 4, verse 34. At the end of the day, I, Daniel, I, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High. I blessed who? I blessed who? Did he praise himself? Glorified himself? Exalted himself? Did he remain in pride? No, the proud heart had been brought low. The pride had been crushed. The pride had been taken away. And now because that pride had been taken away, that's why God reversed the judgment. Let's notice that in our lives. When God is requesting something from you, demanding something from you, and he's saying, live right, and the privileges will come back. Your throne is there. The kingdom is there. The privileges are there. The fellowship is there. Every promise I made to you before everything is there. But turn around and repent. And don't just be banking on when it's time. When they see that it's taking long. Then they'll feel so ashamed and be compelled to restore me to the throne. No, I bless the Most High. And I praise and honor Him that liveth forever. Whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and His kingdom is from, is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. See Nebuchadnezzar, a change of heart had come. A change of life had come. And he says now, now I know that all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? 
at the same time when I realized that. At the same time when I honored, extolled, and exalted the God of heaven. At the same time when humility took hold of me. At the same time when my proud heart was brought down. At the same time my reason returned unto me. For the glory of my kingdom and my honor and my brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my Lord sought unto me. You know, the Lord touched the hearts of those counselors. He said, it's, a, it's time now to go and look for your king. It's still your king. And see what God did. Nobody even fought to take his throne while he became like an animal. God preserved the throne. God was just waiting. He didn't even replace him. He didn't even say, now, why don't you vote again? Why don't you appoint another person? Why don't you elect another person? There's no new election. And nobody stayed on that throne because God was waiting, number one, seven times to pass. Number two, until we know that the God of heaven reigns. Has God given you a promise before? Has God given you a position before? Has God given you a privilege before? And then by pride, by carelessness, by sin, by evil, by iniquity, you lost that privilege. Don't say, well, it's gone. Let me just live the way I want to live. Let me just let myself be free and go at it and do whatever I want to do. No. After all, he's still keeping that privilege. He's still there, but he's waiting for you. And he's saying, when will you realize that pride brings low? When will you realize that haughtiness brings low? You know, there are people that will continue that same haughtiness, and they'll say, if we keep on in that pride and haughtiness, eventually God will have no choice. God will just say, these people, will, they, are, they are what they are. All right, go and be doing what you're doing, not God. Until thou know that the God of heaven does reign. And that the God of heaven will not yield his verdict. His word, his truth on anyone. At the same time, my reason returned unto me. For the glory of my kingdom and my honor and my brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my Lord sought unto me. And I was established in my kingdom and excellent majesty was added unto me. Praise the Lord. Isn't God a God of mercy? Those who repent will find God a God of mercy. And God is still showing that mercy today as people turn away from sin, the sin of pride, and the sin of arrogance, and the sin of haughtiness. As people turn away from their evil, the Lord is still showing mercy. And then he say in verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose words are what? Truth. And all his ways are what? Judgment. And those that walk in pride. Tell me the rest. Is able to abase. And those who walk in humility is able to exalt. Is able to restore. Is able to reinstate. Is able to bring them back unto his grace, and God will bring us back in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. See what the Lord has done. Yes, there's judgment. There's also mercy. Yes, there's rebuke. There is also the love of God and reinstatement and the restoration when we understand that God is God and God wants to rule and reign in the affairs of men. Let's praise the name of the Lord for what he has taught us for what we have learned today. Pray that the Lord will so help you to understand and take the message to heart. Check up your life. Are there some expressions of pride? Some attitudes of pride? Some appearances of pride. Hotiness. 
boasting, pride. God hates pride. He gave Nebuchadnezzar 12 months to turn around, to repent, to seek the face of the Lord, to become humble. But no, he would not. And judgment eventually came. He thought he could conquer God. But what creature can conquer the creator? He thought he was a man of authority, a man of power. And in his authority and power, he thought he was the above God's command, God's demand. But he discovered after the judgment came that God is God and the greatest of men are reputed as nothing in his sight. God is merciful. If you are repentant, God is merciful. If you return from the path of sin, He has promised forgiveness. He has promised pardon. He has promised restoration. He has promised salvation for every sinner that returns back to the bosom of the Father. Why not turn? Will a man strive with his maker? Will a creature strive against the creature? Come down from the Tower of Pride. Don't join the kill of Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Herod, Judas, Lucifer. Get out of that kill. Come to the Lord. In all humility, submission to the will of God. Pride destroys. Pride ruins. And God will judge all the haughtiness of men, all the haughtiness of the daughters of Zion. Why don't you tell the Lord, turn away from pride, turn away from sin, 
and avoid the fiery indignation, the judgment of God. You see that strange punishment that came upon Nebuchadnezzar? God has a thousand and one ways to punish the proud. He has a million and one ways to punish the proud. His power is irresistible. And judgment becomes inevitable. When the sinner continues hardened in sin, when a backslider continues, it is backsliding. Judgment will come. And when judgment comes, when chastisement comes, it's not enough to say, seven weeks have passed already. Seven months have passed already. When will God restore me? It's not just a matter of time. Seven years gone already. Have they forgotten me? It's not a matter of years. It's a matter of repentance. It's a matter of righteousness. Until thou know that the God of heaven rules in the kingdoms of men. Until you know that you are nothing, but God is all in all. If your friend is under chastisement, divine rebuke, don't just keep on wondering, when will the divine rebuke be taken away from my friend? Seven years gone already. Until your friend knows that God is the most high. And when God does anything, no man can say, What doest thou? Until your friend stops competing with God, contradicting God, Until your friend stops being a rival of the Almighty God and he bows, submits, surrenders under the mighty hand of the, of the God of heaven. Until thou know that the God of heaven ruleth in the kingdom of men. Let your life bring glory to God. Let your life honor God. Exalt Him. Praise the Lord. Even for that rebuke. Honor Him. Exalt Him. Glorify His name. Nebuchadnezzar did not dishonor God, insult God, abuse God, call God to question. Because of that chastisement, he knew he was wrong, and God is right. He was unholy, God is holy. He was a sinful one, God is righteous. And he gave the glory to God. Give the glory to God. He didn't complain. 
He didn't foolishly charge God with doing wrong. He wasn't angry with Daniel. Daniel, the interpreter, was not his problem. He was his own problem. The sin was the problem. He knew it. He said, now, I praise, extol, exalt, honor the God of heaven. Give God the glory. Surrender and submit unto Him. Be grateful there is a God that rebukes sin when there is still opportunity to repent. It's repairing you for heaven. That's why it's doing that. He wants you to avoid eternal judgment. That's why it's rebuking you today, correcting you today. Find the way back home. Find the way back to the heart of the Father. Confess your sin before Him. Turn away from the sin. And come honor the God of heaven. Then will there be restoration? My reason restored, returned unto me. My kingdom, my majesty returned unto me. My counselors sought after me. And God brought me back to everything I lost. Because now I know that God ruleth in the kingdom of men. While the door of mercy is still open, come to the Lord today. And as you come, make up your mind. That will not go back again into the sin of pride or any other sin. Nebuchadnezzar did not go back into his evil ways again. After that restoration, his righteousness was continuous. Continue in the faith. Continue in righteousness. Continue under the mighty hand of God in humility and submission to the Lord. Then the restoration will be real and permanent.